Okay, we may start uh, now. Thank you for being here for this uh, session on uh, energy and uh, environment. Uh, during the different uh, session of this uh, WPC, the huge importance of energy and environment uh, has been highlighted several times. And in fact, in times uh, of a multiple crisis, this workshop today will discuss the opportunities and challenges to achieve the goals of energy security, sustainability, affordability, acceptability, and resilience from the perspective of different geographic shareholders maps uh, out credible and realistic pathway through this most demanding period. So around the table, there is a, a, a wonderful panel to cover all the dimension of the energy and environment challenges. And so I will give the floor to the different uh, uh, panelists for uh, 10 minutes. After each presentation, I suggest to have some Q&A session, a short Q&A session, focusing on the specific content of the presentation. And uh, at the end, uh, we will have uh, uh, time for a general debate between the panelists and uh, the, the audience. Uh, so uh, it's my privilege to, to, start, uh, to start by uh, presenting uh, my views on uh, the present situation of uh, the energy uh, sector. And uh, clearly, after COVID crisis in 2020, the energy sector has been faced in 2021 to an unprecedented crisis and to the consequences of the Ukrainian conflict for the last 18 months. So uh, the uh, growth of the energy price had a major impact on uh, inflation worldwide. This slide presents the percentage of countries with an annual inflation greater than 6%. Most of the countries in the world have been faced to an economic shock similar to what we experienced during the oil shocks of 1973 and 1979. Oil price increased rapidly at the beginning of the year from 80 to $120 per barrel due to the uncertainties linked to the Ukrainian conflict. This growth was mitigated by the possible impact of the crisis on the world economy. For the last months, the price went back to the pre-crisis level, so the impact of oil on the inflation is rather limited. Gas electricity market, more specifically in Europe, has been faced to a first crisis in 2021 due to the market design followed by the consequences of the Ukrainian crisis in 2022. The prices of gas increased from 9 euros per megawatt hour in 2020 to 47 euros per megawatt hour in 2021. Then the uncertainty on the availability of Russian gas pushed up the price to 125 euros per megawatt hour in 2022, with peaks at 240 in August. In the US, the gas market was more volatile than during the previous years, but the gas price rarely exceeded $20 per megawatt hour, and today, the price in the US is five times lower than in Europe. The price of electricity followed the price of gas, 113 euros per megawatt hour in 2021, 297 in 2022 compared to the average price in 2020 at 35 euros per megawatt hour. The impact on the energy spending in Europe is huge. 1,200 billion uh, euros in 2022 compared to 
580 in 21 and only 310 in 2020, which represents 8% of the uh, European GDP in 2022 compared to 4% in 2021 and only 2.2% in 2020. Rapidly after the Russian invasion, the European countries and the EU Commission took measures. An embargo on uh, Russian coal was decided uh, on uh, 8th of April and rail later on Russian oil in the, on the 6th of June. And these measures has been taken also in most of the developed countries uh, in the world. An ambitious energy plan has been decided, Repower uh, EU, in order to cope with the dependence of EU countries from Russian supplies. Most of the countries took measures in order to reduce the impact of the price increase on the final consumer or to promote energy sobriety. A decision was taken at EU level to set up a cap on the price of Russian oil and gas. And uh, I remind that in uh, June 2022, the US government launched a massive plan of $400 billion uh, in order to sustain US economy, the Inflation Reduction Act. As a result of these measures taken in Europe and in many other countries, the OECD imports of Russian oil dropped by 50%, 2.5 million barrels per day. However, this drop has been largely compensated by Russian oil export to non-OECD countries, especially <coughs> China and India. In one year, India, in Indian imports of Russian oil has been increased by a factor of 10. Russian export to EU by pipeline dropped from 10 BCM in March uh, 2022 to 1.5 BCM in December. And at the same time, LNG, Russian LNG export increased significantly. At the end of 2022, the share of Russia in the EU uh, gas imports is only 10%. Immediately after the first embargo measures, uh, the price of Russian oil dropped by 30% in order to find consumers. In fact, uh, Russia was obliged to reduce the price in order to increase its export towards non-OECD countries. We should not forget the major event which happened just a year ago, the sabotage of the gas pipe Nord Stream 1 and 2. These pipes were playing a major role on the gas supply of Germany. On the 26th of September 2022, several explosions destroyed the gas pipe of the Danish coast. It is the first time that such a vital infrastructure is attacked in a peace zone. Who is responsible of such a sabotage? There is no clear evidence. However, the clear winner of this uh, sabotage is the US. If such an infrastructure may be attacked during a peacetime, what are the implications on all the vital infrastructure we rely on, both energy telecommunication? The recent attack of the Baltic connector from Finland to Estonia may be another warning call. Some key figures, Russian revenues from energy dropped significantly. The share of Russia on the EU gas supply was reduced from 40% to 10%. EU investment in renewable energy and heat pumps increased by 40%. The electric vehicle markets increased by, by, by 15%, and the EU CO2 emissions were reduced by 2.5%. So in a nutshell, countries, the European countries are the guest losers of this major energy crisis we are faced at. This will have a significant impact 
on our economies. And clearly, the US are the winners. As far as Russia is concerned, the impact on its economy is rather limited on the short term. However, on the longer term, Russia will have difficulties to compensate its European outlets. For the last few weeks, the dramatic conflict between Israel and the Hamas is bringing a new dimension to the world energy crisis, but for the time being, we didn't see a, uh, an evidence of what could happen due to this new, uh, new crisis. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the scene I wanted to, to describe. And uh, before I leave the floor to the uh, different uh, panelists, are there some questions? To, uh, to ask or some comments. Yeah, please. Just a brief question regarding you, exports. you. Yeah, just a brief uh, question regarding Indian exports to uh, Europe. Do we have numbers regarding how much Indian exports to Europe have increased? That would be interesting to see how much of the gap India and China ac actually filled that, you know, the void that was left by Russia. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Thank you. But as far, you know, uh, as far as oil is concerned, nobody knows exactly where the oil is is going. But clearly, the imports of Russian oil has been over India has been increased by a factor of 10. That that's another story. <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you so much, Anna Borchev from Romania. Thank you so much for a great presentation. But uh, you didn't mention nuclear, the energy from nuclear, uh, which, you know, we know that France has a, such a great tradition. Romania has such a great tradition. And we are actually working very closely together at the EU level. And we all know that the energy from uh, nuclear is one of the cleanest, affordable, and um, more reliable sources of energy. So maybe in your presentation, you might want to consider to add that part as well. And maybe later on, we can, during the debate, I could intervene in a more elaborative way. Thank you. Don't understand uh, on my presentation that I underestimate the role of nuclear, but I was focusing on uh, a world, uh, an energy world in a deep crisis. And if I would have, unfortunately, if I, I would uh, 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 raise the flag of a, a, a problem of nuclear, it is the availability of nuclear in Europe, which uh, in France, which have been reduced dramatically due maintenance issues uh, uh, due to the COVID and also due to uh, technical problems. Fortunately, we are out of this uh, situation. But in August 2022, for the first time in 30 years, uh, France was a net importer of electricity. But uh, clearly now I think there is an increasing consensus in France and in Europe in order to develop, uh, the, uh, to, to develop nuclear energy, to base the energy transition uh, in, on, uh, on nuclear, and there is also within European countries an increasing uh, consensus, but there are also some countries strongly opposed to nuclear energy. You know what I mean. Olivier, it was not a bad technique, it was new norms. The reason why a nuclear power plants were closed in France was mainly for no nomadic reasons rather than bad technology. It's important to say. So if uh, there is no more question, uh, you may afterwards uh, ask a question. You may afterwards uh, ask a question. So now I leave the floor to Nicola Terraz. Nicola Terraz is the president of Exploration Production of Total Energy. Uh, you made a, a wonderful presentation yesterday. And thank you to uh, be here for this uh, session. And now I leave you the floor. 
Thank you, Olivier. It's a pleasure for me to be here to share a few comments about the energy context and then about uh, what is the strategy of a company like Total Energy in, in, in this context. So, you know, when thinking about the energy context, the first point I want to make is that the demand for energy is increasing today, not decreasing. It's increasing because of population increase, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in emerging countries, in the global south, because of aspirations also to uh, better living standards. So we have to meet this growing demand for energy. At the same time, of course, we, I mean, we have a collective responsibilities, companies, government, to, to address uh, the, the climate change. And, uh, and there is a real imperative to achieve the, the climate neutrality for the planet. The third point I want to make is that people, they want energy, but they also want affordable energy. Uh, and it's a constant, you know, in France, in Europe, in the US, in Brazil, in Nigeria, when energy prices increase, people go to the street. So there is a need also to provide, to make energy available, but also to ensure that this energy is affordable. And all this in a system where today fossil fuel represents for 80% of the, of the global energy mix. So a growing demand for energy, a climate neutrality imperative, need to provide affordable energy, even with the massive investment required for the energy transition, on a starting point, which is today 80% fossil fuel. So, so I think if you, if you consider those four elements together, it gives an idea of the magnitude of the challenge that we are facing in, uh, in, in our sector. Let me just uh, then focus a bit on the various energies. I, I will start with oil. Oil today is about 30% of the energy mix. Uh, the global oil production is about, to make it simple, 100 million barrels per day. Uh, the International Energy Agency, a number of organizations, are you know, making forecasts of what is the future oil uh, production, and when is oil production or demand actually going to, to decline. At Total Energy, we see more or less the oil production uh, stabilizing over the decade and then starting to decline from 2030. To reach a level in 2050, you know, when we aim to be carbon neutral, somewhere between 40 and 60 million barrels per day, compared to 100 today because there will still be a demand for oil for a number of, of uses that today we, we don't see how they can be substituted. Now, the reality today is that the oil demand is not decreasing. So we are not yet on that decline curve. This year, the oil demand will be 102 million barrels per day, plus 2 million versus last year. So plus 2 million, to give you an idea, a company like Total Energy is producing 1.4 million barrels per day of oil globally. So plus 2 million in one year is 1.5 times the production of total. Uh, and it's about 20 to 30 very large projects to be started to supply that demand. So I think it's important to understand that, that all of us are expecting to see, in fact, a decline in the oil production, but today it's not yet the case. Um, The demand, I talked about the demand, now the supply of oil. I mentioned it yesterday, but I think it's always important to remember that there is a natural decline of oil field production, which is much greater, by the way, than for gas. It's about 4% per year. So if you do nothing every year out of your 100 million barrels per day, you lose 4 million in face of a demand, you know, that is increasing by 2 million. So that's why in our company, we're saying we need investments in new oil and gas projects. Although we can start, we can stop investing, of course. But if we stop investing, there is very quickly a large imbalance between supply and demand. And very quickly, prices are going to skyrocket. And we are back to the issue of uh, affordability of energy and acceptability of all this. Gas. So today, gas is about a quarter of the, of the global energy mix. Um, we see gas as a, a great uh, fuel for the transition, simply because there is still a huge potential to substitute coal for gas. 
or coal by gas, particularly for power generation. Uh, the share of coal in uh, the energy mix is slightly higher than the share of gas, by the way. Uh, coal is, is more than a quarter of the energy mix still today. So there is this substitution. We see uh, uh, demand for gas actually uh, increasing over the coming years. Uh, on a key requirement for gas to be an acceptable transition fuel is, of course, to eliminate all the methane emissions from gas production, gas transportation, and gas use uh, to make sure that actually gas is a positive contributor uh, to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Electricity uh, is, of course, uh, I would say the the core of the new energy system, because we know that electrification is, uh, is going to play a, a super important role in the decarbonization of the energy system. Uh, it's a key lever for the energy transition. It will mobilize certainly massive investments, continue to mobilize massive investments in the future, not only in electric power generation, particularly from renewables, but also in transportation and networks. Uh, and power systems will become more and more complex, at least that's the way we see it, uh, with the, the massive arrival of, uh, of renewable power generation and the impact it has on the management of power systems. Uh, and what we need to remember also is that electric power customers or users, they want firm power, they don't want intermittent power, uh, which means that even if renewables will play a very important role in the future, they need to be complemented by flexible power generation sources, so gas-fired power generation, or storage, by the way. So that's what I wanted to say as a few ideas about the energy sector. And, and, and now let me move to what is, what is the strategy of Total Energy, what we're trying to achieve in this context, which is both challenging and, I would say, exciting. Bon. Our strategy, we summarize it uh, very simply by saying uh, we want to produce more energy with less emissions. More energy for the reason I mentioned, because there is a growing demand for energy by a growing population. Uh, and in total energies, we expect to continue increasing our energy production while diversifying, of course, our mix with more low carbon energy. Less emissions at the same time, uh, and we've taken a commitment to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% between 2015 and 2030. Uh, and I will say a few words about how we're going to achieve that. Uh, but my first message is that companies like Total Energy, and I think a number of our peers actually are uh, pursuing the similar strategies, is to be able to, to supply more energy to people with less emissions, which is a real challenge per se. So today, we see our future activity and our strategy based on two pillars. First pillar is oil and gas. Second pillar is what we call integrated power. So to give you an idea, today we dedicate about two thirds of our investment, uh, our capital expenditure program to the first pillar, oil and gas. So about $11 billion per year. And one third of our capital expenditures to the second pillar, which is renewable power generation, low carbon molecules. Uh, so two thirds, one third. Uh, 10, $11 billion for the first one, $5 billion per year for the second one. Which in fact is a massive shift compared to where we were five years ago, where the second pillar was close to zero. So for the first pillar, uh, oil and gas, uh, of course, to achieve our more energy, less emissions uh, uh, strategy, uh, we are focusing on uh, oil and gas projects, which are both low cost and low emissions. Low cost because we want our projects to be resilient through the cycles. And I don't need to tell you that, you know, Olivier mentioned about the oil price uh, variations over the, the recent period, but we are in a very volatile uh, market. So all our new projects we've set for our sales criteria, they need to have, you know, a technical cost below $20 per barrel to be resilient at $50 per barrel. On low emissions, 
because it's a way to uh, achieve uh, our target to decrease by 40% our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So what does it mean, low emissions? Uh, it means that uh, when we look at the emission intensity of our production, so the quantity of CO2 that we emit for one barrel or one barrel equivalent produced, today the figure is 20. And by the end of the decade, our target is to reach 13, 13 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel. So to do this, we work both on our existing production base and on our new projects. Existing production base, uh, we are, um, basically our emissions are coming from our own energy consumption, and they are, which is the majority of our emissions, and they are coming from flaring. So we are gradually eradicating, in fact, flaring, and routine flaring will be eradicated from all our facilities in a couple of years. Uh, even if our target was 2030. And then we are deploying new technology to stop completely flaring, including, you know, the safety flaring that we usually have in our facilities. We have systems of, you know, closed flare, where basically today we can produce oil and gas with zero flaring. Energy consumption, we are spending this year and next year $1 billion to improve the energy efficiency in our facilities. So we are doing, you know, like any industrial company, willing to reduce its energy consumption. We are installing combined cycle power generation units on our offshore production facilities in, in, instead of traditional gas turbines. We are electrifying our facilities uh, or a number of projects with renewable power generation. So we are taking care of our own emissions, you know, uh, and of course, hoping that the energy users or customers will, uh, uh, will, will follow the same approach. Um, one principle that we've set for ourselves is that all our new projects, oil and gas projects, must have a greenhouse gas intensity below the average of our portfolio, the average of our production. So by doing that, that's the way we can reduce gradually the emissions from our production. Low emissions for us is also uh, uh, aiming at uh, zero methane emissions, uh, because I, as I mentioned, the, the, we see gas as a great transition fuel, but provided we can eradicate methane emissions. Uh, so we decreased our methane emissions by half uh, over the last decade. Uh, on our target is to further reduce by 50%, another 50% by 2025, and be near zero methane emissions in 2030. So I'm going to accelerate a bit, talk about the second pillar of our strategy, which is integrated power, as I mentioned. Um, electricity was about 5% of our overall production uh, last year. And we target to bring this to 20% by 2030. Alors, some people may say 20% isn't a lot, but to go from 5% to 20%, we need to invest every year $4 billion in our integrated power business, which is probably actually one of the largest investments by a single company in Europe in renewable. In 2030, we'll have Today, we invest $4 billion per year. This year, we invest $4 billion in electricity power generation, mostly from renewables. Um, so we've got this massive investment program. Uh, we are planning to generate over 100 terawatt hour of renewable electricity by 2030. But then, when we say integrated power, uh, our objective at the end of the day is not only to generate more renewable power, but is also to provide firm power to customers, which is what is required, in fact. So our strategy really is to integrate this renewable power generation with flexible power generation from combined cycle gas turbines, with storage uh, from batteries, you know, to manage intermittency from renewables, in order to be able to deliver this firm, clean power to our customers. Uh, and of course, uh, we're trying to build uh, an integrated power business, which is also a profitable business, because we're a company and we have shareholders. And so we put a lot of energy and focus on, you know, producing better, 
developing projects better at a lower cost and selling better. Uh, for projects, I think we recognize that uh, you know there are a lot of uh, utilities around the world which have much more experience in the electricity power business uh, than, than we have. Still, we have a large uh, offshore experience, for instance. Uh, so we try to focus on areas where we can be competitive, such as uh, offshore wind. And of course, uh, I will finish with that, uh, because Olivier is telling me that I passed my time already. Uh, but uh, we also try to develop more and more multi-energy projects. Uh, a good example of this is what we are doing in Iraq, where um, we, are, we have a, a four-component project where we develop uh, the production from an existing oil field uh, to generate money. And part of this money is used uh, to gather and process a lot of natural gas that is currently being flared in Iraq to supply power generation in the country. Uh, and at the same time, we develop a one gigawatt solar plant uh, in the same area in the south of Iraq to supply power to local people. And we believe that this kind of, uh, and there is a fourth component, which is basically to, uh, to build a large seawater treatment plant uh, to be able to uh, replace groundwater being used you know, for injection into uh, the oil field uh, in the south of Iraq by treated seawater and so to alleviate the hydric stress. And we believe this type of multi-energy project uh, today is a, is a good solution, a good solution for a, a, a responsible energy supply, and it's also a good solution for the acceptability of what we are doing. Voilà, I'm going to stop there. Thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. Are there some uh, questions on this uh, presentation? Yeah, please, you, you push your button. Push the button. Yeah, just one quick question on this Iraq thing that you mentioned about natural gas flaring. It's converting into electricity. Any plans by Total or your partners there basically to monetize even deeper and more comprehensively to convert that into LNG for export? No, we, we, we've not. In fact, the, the project is ready to supply uh, uh, electricity for the local requirements because the local needs are huge. And you need to know that today, Iraq, there is a lot of gas being flared in Iraq, but at the same time, the country is importing gas from Iran, in fact. So, you know, the idea is pretty simple. is to supply gas for the local power generation plants, which are existing already, and to substitute import by local production. So, uh, so no plan for LNG simply because uh, the demand is there. So you plan to capture all that gas which is being flared so that it can be monetized maybe for the benefit of the local population or the local economy? Sorry, I was not clear. The plan is to collect all this gas that is currently being flared, to process it to commercial specs, and to supply it to gas-fired power plant, but locally. Thank you very much on, uh, on this talk. Uh, uh, Jeremy Finn from uh, Blue Water Intelligence. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, a peak. So in any uh, system, uh, energy, energy system, there is a, the, you, the system needs to be balanced. And uh, you mentioned uh, that you are developing uh, battery capabilities to, to handle the peak in a low carbon way. Uh, so there are other ways. So first of all, wh what is the capability of your batteries uh, at the moment? Uh, because it's not simple uh, technology uh, at large scale. And uh, are you considering other um, energy sources? Uh, and typically, uh, countries look at. I mean, intermittent energies are not the, the solution for peak. So typically, countries look at either nuclear or hydropower to. Uh, nuclear for capability, hydropower for storage, uh, dams in particular. So are you looking at? Uh, these, I, I believe uh, nuclear, no, because it's written in your annual report, but who knows? It may change. And uh, how about hydro hydropower are you considering uh, this? So three questions, battery capability, nuclear, yes or no? And are you looking at hydropower? Thank you very much. So battery capabilities, uh, uh, alors, you know, we, we, we assess it for each project, depending on what is the market. 
uh, what is the demand structure, what is the pricing structure, uh, what is the customer requirement, whether we sell on a deregulated market, you know, on a merchant way, or whether we have a PPA with an industrial customer to which we need to provide firm power. But typically, for a large portion of our new renewable projects, today we associate them with battery. On, you were asking what is the size of your storage. It depends, but for a one gigawatt, typically for a one gigawatt uh, renewable project, we'll have a storage capacity uh, ranging anywhere between 300 to 600 gigawatt hours. So it's pretty large, uh, in fact. Um, <coughs> so that's for batteries. Then, uh, yes, you're right. Battery is not the only solution to manage intermittency. You know, enfin, we are doing it in a there is pump storage, uh, hydro, uh, other ways to do it, and we are looking at this, definitely. We are looking at all ways, actually, to manage uh, intermittency. Nuclear, no, we are not, uh, we are not investing in nuclear, which uh, doesn't mean that we don't believe nuclear is a good solution. Uh, I think nuclear is, uh, has, a, has, a, has a role to play in a decarbonized energy mix, and, uh, uh, and we certainly recognize that. Uh, but it's not our competency, you know, we are doing, uh, we have our two pillars, uh, we have no experience, nuclear is complicated. Uh, and then we tend to think also for, you know, we are looking also at the long-term liabilities, and we think like uh, for a private company like Total, managing the long-term liabilities associated with nuclear is not, is not easy. Thank you. Yeah, you have the floor. Um, Renaud Girard from Le Figaro. Should I speak French because everybody understands French or no? It's not, it's not translated, so I will speak English. Um, I would like to know the impact of a small uh, geopolitical event that happened in February 22, which was the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, on total business. Um, what was the shift? of your business, so um, um, can you tell us the shift of business between uh, January 21st and uh, January, 1st of January 2024? Um, and how much it cost to the company, this uh, small uh, geopolitical event, and how could you face it? Did you have like reserve? Did the government help you? Did the European Union help you? How did you face this, um, this lack of, uh, this change of business? So on, uh, on this, uh, Renaud, first, uh, the impact on our business, I think we communicated fairly openly and clearly on what, uh, you know, what business principles we decided to apply after the invasion of Ukraine. First thing that uh, we abide with sanctions, no matter what is the impact uh, on our activities, and, and we are doing so. Second, what we did immediately was uh, to stop you know, purchase of uh, oil and petroleum products from Russia. Then we started a gradual withdrawal, you know, uh, of uh, winding down of our activities. Uh, we had uh, one oil production field in Russia, Karyaga, that we sold and we exited that. We had a gas field, you know, for domestic supply, uh, Thermokarst, uh, and we ex exited that. And uh, then, uh, you know, we communicated that we deconsolidated uh, our interest in Novatech. We kept an interest, uh, our interest in Yamal LNG, which is a liquefaction plant supplying Europe. Uh, one of our principles being that we continue to supply uh, LNG from Russia to Europe as long as uh, European governments actually uh, are considering that this is uh, desirable and that there is no sanction of that. Uh, the cost of all this, uh, I think, is public because, you know, we took a total depreciation on... Uh, on Russia of 14.8 uh, billion dollars, to be specific, so close to 15 billion dollars, uh, 14.8. No, the government did not uh, help us. Uh, uh, 
it's not a pr practice in, uh, in the company to ask for uh, monetary support from the government. Uh, I don't think we would get it anyway, so we're trying to you manage our business by ourselves. Around, no? Yes, it can be the other way around. Quoi. But, you mean uh, that you are not like the big banks? You don't, uh, when you have a problem, you don't ask the government to help you? No, no, no. There is a... In fact, the, the, uh, so, so yes, it's a hit, you know, uh, on the business of the company, but uh, it's a hit that the company can manage. We have a limit hein, uh, in the amount of capital employ that uh, we put in each individual country. So in Russia, we were, you know, at the higher end, not far from the limit, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a sane rule, and actually the Russian crisis has demonstrated against to us that uh, we need to stick to that rule. Uh, what is the capital? Course, what uh, is the maximum? It's fifteen percent per country, or what? Ten percent. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I can say. After, of course, uh, there is an impact on our production. You know, total energy was. Uh, if you look at our reports, uh, annual reports, uh, we were 2.8 million barrel equivalent per day company two years ago. Uh, today we are at uh, two, last year we were at 2.4, this year 2.5, so there is a gap. Hein. Uh, we are developing uh, our LNG business uh, outside uh, Russia, you know, uh, so we have a number of, uh, of projects. We recently uh, announced that we joined uh, Rio Grande LNG in the US. Uh, we are preparing to take a final investment decision on Papua LNG. Uh, we are participating in uh, the very large uh, north field expansions in, in Qatar, in uh, those six new LNG trains. We have Mozambique LNG. We are participating in expansions in Nigeria LNG and Oman LNG. So we are growing our LNG, I would say, uh, uh, from, uh, from outside Russia. Uh, we increased, actually, a lot of LNG imports uh, to Europe uh, from other sources last year. And I think we contributed in a meaningful manner, actually, to the continuity of supply of gas to Europe. Uh, so that's the way uh, that's the way we are doing. Thank you. I, th I think that's a, a huge, uh, a good opportunity to leave the floor to Jean Abitboul. Jean Abitboul, who is uh, president of the international group of LNG importer and who spent all his career in uh, natural gas. And so, Jean, you have the floor. For Thank you, Olivier. So I will preach more or less for my church and mention more specifically natural gas, but I will start. So this one seems a little bit complex, but it shows uh, three different things in the same, on the same slide. The size of the square is the size of the world market. So in 20, 2000, 2010, and 2022. Then the color shows the different kind of energies. And inside one color, you can see the different countries. So it's a little bit complex. And I will not spend too much time on that. But it gives you all the figures related to the different kind of energy. There was a question about nuclear. Nuclear is in uh, orange pink. And you can see that nuclear still is still a rather small part of the world energy mix. It was 7% in 2000. It, will, it is 4% on the world energy mix in 2022. So in black, you can see the coal. So you can see that the coal is still uh, very important. and. Uh, increase its shares, 25% uh, in 2000, 27% in 2022. So coal is st still very important. You can see the growth in green of the renewable, 1% in 2000, 7% in 2022. And the size of natural gas is more or less the same, 20, 22% in 2000, 23% in 2022, but of course it's 23% of a larger square. 
the global energy mix went from 9.2 million ton oil equivalent to 14.4 uh, million ton uh, equivalent. Uh, just a snapshot on coal, coal was 30% in 2010 and is 27% in 2022. And a big part of this uh, decrease in coal consumption has been uh, replaced by natural gas. So as a consequence, Next slide, you can see that the GHG emission. Ah, je ne sais pas sur le bon. Si, it's a, it's a new one. It looks like the old one, but it's a new one. Uh, you can see that the GHG emission, CO2 emission, to be more specific, have been growing by 2.8 percent per year for 20 for 2000 to 2010, and from 2010 to 2022, the growth is only, only can be discussed, but it's a fact, by 0.9% year on year. So the main explanation to that, and the fact that, uh, the main explanation to that is a replacement of coal by uh, natural gas. There is also a small part from renewable, but the share of renewable is still too low to have today a significant impact on CO2 emissions. Uh, now, the, the LNG, so the, this is the part of uh, interregional gas trade on the left side. You can see that uh, the pipeline part of inter-regional gas trade has decreased from 2021 to 2022 by 5% and has been replaced by LNG, so it's a direct consequence of the Ukraine uh, war. On the left, you can see the uh, LNG import by sources and by destination. You can see on the top of the graph the big three export countries, United States, Australia, and Qatar. Qatar and Australia are more or less the same. But you can see the growth on United States, 21 and 22. And you can see that Europe from 21 to 22 on the downside part of uh, of the slide has grown uh, significantly also as a consequence of the Ukrainian war. So in Europe, LNG has filled the gap, the gap created by the disruption of Russian gas. You can see on the left the Russian pipe imports in uh, red or orange. You can see the decrease. And you can see on the right the increase of the US LNG to Europe. So to make it short, in Europe, the Russian gas has been replaced by LNG from the US. So I like this one because I, the title of this one could be uh, the invisible hand of the market or could be also entitled Leave Me Alone. What do I mean by leaving me alone? Uh, all the governments have tried to do something to, uh, to cope with the issue of the Russian gas in 2021 and beginning, uh, wait, 2022 and beginning of 2023. So they have tried to imagine new systems in Europe of common purchase, which, by the way, is illegal and, and, uh, under the co competition law. They have tried to imagine price cap. They have tried to imagine common tenders, etc., etc. One could think that part of these measures have been useful. Personally, I believe that the market has done the job. 
When you look on the left part of this slide, you can see that the Ninja imports from 2021 on the top to 2022 on the back, you can see the growth from 70 to 110 million ton per country. And on the next part of the slide, you can see the decrease of LNG import in Asia per country. And you can see that, so there is an increase in Europe of 40 million ton of LNG import, partially offset by a decrease by about 20 million ton of LNG, which used to go to Asia. And how is it possible that this LNG doesn't go anymore to Asia? But the answer is very simple. The answer is coal. The prices of LNG have skyrocketed so much that some LNG countries, some uh, Asian countries, especially China, India, and Indonesia, have naturally replaced LNG by coal for their electricity production. It's not an intervention of the government. It's not because uh, Emmanuel Macron has asked to China, please give me some LNG to replace Russian gas. It's just because the market has been working. So there was a double swap, coal to LNG in Asia, uh, sorry, LNG to coal in Asia, and LNG from Asia to Europe, to replace Russian gas. So the price signals did work without any intervention from the government and from Europe. And since today in the LNG market, 30% of the quantities are spot, you have 20 exporting countries, you have 45 importing countries, you have 734 LNG tankers, so you have a huge fleet of LNG tankers. The market works. We had already seen that during the Fukushima issue, where it was exactly the other way around, and additional LNG went to Japan to replace the nuke, which was uh, cut by the Fukushima issue. So my main message is the LNG market really provide flexibility. The price signals work. Of course, the replacement of LNG by coal in Asia is not a good, good news uh, as far as CO2 emissions are concerned. But there is today such a flexibility in the LNG market that LNG market can cope with, uh, with crisis. So the next slide is expectation on the future. I will not spend too much time on that, but it, it is numbers coming from the EIA in uh, two assumptions. The one on the top is stated policies scenario and the, 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 the one on the downside of the slide is announce pledge scenario. So on the top, it is a, a state uh, of the art uh, um, assumption. And on the back, when uh, you, you can see what would be the consequences of what the different states I have announced in terms of uh, pledges to reduce uh, green, greenhouse gas emission. On the right, just for information, you can see different scenario on the growth of LNG. Uh, you can find the big three, United States, Qatar, and Australia. And there are two countries which can provide additional LNG, it's uh, United States and Qatar on a significant um, point of view. So this is basically what I wanted uh, to say, Olivier. Thank you. So I leave the floor for uh, a few questions. Yeah. Uh, Jean, um, 
this um, Russian attack of Ukraine, do we have an idea how much it cost to Europe or to Europe uh, consumers to uh, shift from uh, Russian gas to American LNG or Qatari? Do you have a, a vague assessment of how much it cost the, uh, would be interesting, the, the um, uh, European consumer? And my second question is in terms of carbon emission, the fact that we saw that um, India, China, and Indonesia went back to, um, uh, to um, coal. What is the impact on the, on, um, on the carbon emission of the decision of the West to stop uh, importing uh, Russian energy? So the, these are good questions, and I'm not sure to have the full answer to, to those questions. On, on the first question, I read, uh, not by you, of course, <laughs> but that, <laughs> but others which are less informed, that the replacement, the, the, the US have made, a, a, no, I would say that another way. Europe has paid a huge amount of money uh, because Russian gas has been replaced by US LNG. This is factually true, because to make it simple, in Europe, the spot prices were around, let's say, uh, eight, ten dollars per million BTU, Olivier, the order of magnitude. Now in 2020. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the order of magnitude. After the invasion of Ukraine, this number went at the maximum of the crisis to fifty dollars per million BTU. So it's a it's a increase by four hundred percent. So people said the U.S. LNG cost a huge amount of money to the European consumer. No, it's not the U.S. LNG. It's because there was less LNG on the market, and the price signals did work. And if it w there was not US LNG to replace part of the Russian gas, the prices would have been maybe not $50 per million BTU, but maybe 100, 200, or whatever it is, because there would be a physical gap in the supply demand of LNG, and this gap would have not been filled by prices. And we would have to cut the gas in Europe to consumer or to industrial consumer, whatever, which has not been done. Having said that, it's true that multiplying the prices by four or, or five, even if it's for a limited period of time, it has cost a lot of money because US LNG, mainly US, was in competition, there was a competition between Europe and Asia. And it took time to displace gas in Asia to be replaced by coal. So the exact numbers, I have no idea, but if you take uh, maybe uh, Olivier, you have an idea, if you have an increase of 400% of the gas prices during uh, three months, this is the equivalent of uh, doubling or tripling the prices during one full year. So if I multiply by, uh, uh, I need a few uh, seconds to do the multiplication. I, 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 I gave, I I gave some, uh, some figures in my presentation. And in fact, the cost for Europe of uh, the, the, the crisis, there are two crises. The crisis of the European market of gas and electricity in 2021, and on the top of that, there is a crisis of Ukraine. And uh, the figures is uh, just, uh, the figures I presented is uh, that the uh, spending on energy in Europe represent 2.2% of the GDP in 2020, it moved to 4% in 2021 and 8% in 2022. 
This may mean that the crisis in Europe of the markets, electricity and gas market, cost 2% of GDP, in, uh, uh, and on the top of that, 4% due to the uh, Ukraine crisis. Just rough idea. Yeah? It's and very interesting to look. Um, maybe just if you give me one second to to address the second question of uh, Renault on the uh, cost in terms of CO2 emission. So, uh, in rough in rough numbers, in China there was an increase. I would say by the uh, uh, 30 million ton oil equivalent of, uh, of coal increase, 30 million plus, uh, I would say, uh, 50 million, I would say 100 million ton oil equivalent. And each time you, you replace uh, gas by coal, you multiply by two the CO2 emissions, so I, I ask for help from my friends, Nicolas or Olivier, on the 100 million ton oil equivalent. If you multiply by two, um, how much CO2 does it cost? <laughs> we'll give you the figures afterwards. Okay. Uh, uh, please, so there are two questions. Thank, First. You, Oli thank you, Olivier. It's not necessarily a question, more of a comment. It's very interesting to look um, from the policy point of view of the cost after, but I will kindly put for the analysis to look what were the costs before because of the dependency of Europe of the Russian gas. And Oliver, with, in a humble way, I can challenge that actually the uh, winner of Nord Stream 2 was the United States. In my humble opinion, I think the big winners were the Central Eastern Europe countries who got their chance to uh, not be prisoners of the Russian gas uh, used by Putin as a weapon. And I can tell you from my personal experience, when I was Deputy Prime Minister in 2018, it was Romania and Poland who was saying in Brussels on the record and off the record, take away the, the energy from Putin's hands because he's going to use it as a weapon. Unfortunately, we were right. So um, maybe as we are talking from the policy point of view, it will be interesting to look what, you know, what were the costs of being so dependent on the Russian gas. It's not necessarily the case of my country, Romania, because we've been quite wise in terms of having the energy mix and we were practically from all the Central Eastern Europe countries, we had the less dependency. But I can tell you, for that 15% that we were getting from Russia, the same gas from Russia for Romania was the highest. Actually, there was another country who, had, who paid higher, was the Republic of Moldova. Then it was Romania. And uh, you know the same amount of gas on the same day from Russia, we were paying the highest price where other countries in Europe in European Union, quite frankly, we're paying the cheapest. So I think looking at, you know, from drawing some lessons and recommendations from the future is, uh, you know, look what was happening and how energy is practically a matter of security, in my opinion, and should be treated this way. Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, I, I agree. Well, I, when I, I said that uh, the U.S. were the winners, it's on the, the economic point of view because it reinforced. And now the European Union is depending more and more on U.S. Uh, LNG. Uh, I would like to highlight, uh, we discussed about uh, Ukraine. I would like to highlight the fact that in uh, uh, 2014, the share of Russia in uh, the supply, in gas supply of Europe, was 30 percent. And uh, after, an, in 2014, uh, there was invasion of Crimea, and the share increased from 30 percent to 40 percent. How blind we are, especially Germany. I, I, would, I would like, if you allow me, Olivier, to say a few words about the winner, U.S., etc. I think you are right when you say that U.S. was against uh, North Stream. It's, it's obvious. It's because U.S. was not comfortable of having Europe 
too dependent of, on Russia for strategic reasons. And they were right. But it doesn't mean that the aim was to replace Russia with US LNG. It's two different issues. Because uh, in the US, there is a debate. There are people who believe that it's not a good idea to export gas from the US. They believe that the consequence would be first to increase the price of gas for domestic consumers. And they also believe that in doing that, US uh, is not keeping for itself its strategic advantage of having cheap energy. So there is a real debate on that. And until Chenier built its first uh, export facility in Sabine Pass, exporting natural gas from the US was illegal. The law forbid the US to export gas. Yes. So in order to do that, US had, it was during uh, President Obama mandate, they had to change the law. So I don't believe that the US had in mind to do something which at the end of the, of the day would allow them to export gas to Europe. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry, the, the time yeah, is moving you. rapidly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would like to clarify, I was not implying that. Yeah. But I was just saying that, you know, energy was treated as a matter of security. And exactly from that point of view, yes, I don't think that was wise for Europe to be so dependent on the Russian gas. And as a matter of principle, I think going for the future, we should be very careful not to, uh, not to replace one dependency with another dependency, disregarding the names, just as a matter of <coughs> principle and as a lesson going forward. I, I'm afraid that uh, when, uh, uh, if Trump is coming back, uh, it will be very difficult to find uh, uh, natural gas for the supply of Europe. And anyway, it will be very, very expensive. So, but just a comment. Yeah, just a uh, yeah. short question and a short answer. <coughs> short comment, short question. Short comment that is that you focus on uh, uh, US exports of LNG. Uh, remember that. Uh, just uh, from uh, uh, July to August, uh, July 22 to August 23, the exports of U.S. coal to Europe rose by 50%. Export of U.S. oil to Europe to the point that now the dollar is a commodity currency. That's uh, just a point. Now, my question is, um, we spoke about the price of natural gas. Usually, we had three markets. We had the US market, we had the European market, and we had the LNG market in Asia. We have still the American market, and more and more, the European market is linked to the LNG market in Asia. That LNG market used to be for a long time a market of long-term contracts. Uh, in recent years, spot transactions developed, and all the prices you mentioned were on spot transactions. Uh, what is the situation nowadays? I heard that, for example, uh, Total has signed a 27 years contract with Qatar. Uh, Eni and Shell have more or less done the same. I don't know what are the conditions of prices, but does this mean that the reference of prices will be an eventual spot market? Uh, what kind of spot market? We don't have for the moment any futures on LNG. What do you think could be the future, knowing that uh, uh, the price of, your, uh, of gas in Europe now is subject to what happens to strikes at uh, Chevron and Shell uh, fa facilities in Australia, or eventually uh, the absence of, ex of export of Israeli gas to Egypt. So do you think we'll have a globalization of LNG market with uh, 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 spot and futures, or we will go back to, I don't know if Total could tell us uh, how much they will pay in 27 years, the natural gas they will import from Qatar. But uh, what kind of price mechanism are you 
or are we going like any other commodities, just on spot and futures? But, no, I but think but I... Excuse uh, me, uh, Oliver, is it not... We have three more speakers. Yeah, 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 Would yeah, it not more, be a, more, four more very, speakers? Very, very perhaps short, we fine, should... It, it was a very good question, but short, we should have the answer. speakers first, perhaps. No, short I'll answer. be very quick. Um, the, f f first, what we need to keep in mind is that today the energy market is very tense and will remain so for three, four years. So any event, uh, the price go up very quickly. Bon. But then a lot of projects are coming. So you know, by 2028, probably it's going to change. That's number one. Uh, and number two is long-term contracts. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, everybody is in favor of long-term contracts. We, uh, I mean, we, we advocate for long-term contracts. The problem is that to take a long-term commitment, you need to have a long-term visibility. And in Europe, it's a problem. Because in Europe, you know, if the EU is saying we want to eradicate gas from the energy mix, then how do you want people to build infrastructures and take long-term commitments on gas? So it's, it's complex, and in fact, there is a risk that we're going to pay the price for this in Europe. I, I suggest, excuse me, I suggest to move to the uh, fourth speaker, Igor Jürgen. So, so we will move to a more regional approach after the uh, approach by, uh, uh, by energy. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, you, Igor will uh, f focus on uh, sustainable uh, development in Russia and Eurasian Economic Union. She is the chairman of management board of the Institute of Contemporary Development and vice president of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs. So you have the floor. I give you 10 minutes. Thank you very and much. Thank plus you. Thank you very much. To be a good Russian, I will curtail my speech because there are so many people behind me. So let me just show you what I wanted to tell you and then uh, a little bit to comment on the situation in, in Russian energy sector. So Russian Federation started a real uh, integration into the ESG world. There is a carbon regulation, there is a sustainable fin finance regulation, there is regulation of ESG ri risks by the central bank. And the, we create the methodical uh, framework for talking in all of those ESG factors into the development uh, of uh, industry in Russian Federation, not only industry and financial markets too. But we're not alone. We want to build it on the e Eurasian space. Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan uh, are part of, of, those, uh, of this uh, union. Kazakhstan is m very much in, in uh, advanced. They started in 2013, so they already have a carbon exchange. They have a pretty advanced financial market with green bonds and stuff like that. They have taxonomy approved. They have mandatory disclosure of non-financial uh, uh, information for all organizations, which we, we, we don't have it in Russia. It's, on, it's only voluntary and it's only a fraction. Kyrgyzstan is a little bit behind, but they are beginning very serious development. Uh, in Bishkek, they uh, now have uh, uh, the draft national taxonomy, and now they approve the guidelines. And they copy Kazakhstan because this is the closest neighbor, and uh, definitely. Uh, there is uh, serious progress there. Belarus uh, talks a lot, but is not very much on, on, uh, on time schedule. Uh, but they're developing different subje uh, objects uh, of this sustainable development. And they have a state concept of the green bonds of Republic, for example, verification system, and so on and so forth. Uh, Armenians a little bit behind, but they also have uh, el an elements of uh, uh, stock exchange with green bonds and national road map for stable finance. Uh, and I, I, I want to uh, just to uh, on uh, at this part of my presentation, I want to say that no matter what we do, uh, Chinese uh, Reg regulatory system and Chinese uh, stock exchange, Chinese financial instruments and standard setting are well ahead of us. They work uh, for, a, for, for at least 15 years on that stuff. And if uh, we know that International Sustainability Standard Board, in, with, which is headquartered in Montreal, 
uh, decided to uh, take Asia on board, they delegated to to Chinese People's Republic because they are so advanced in methodology, regulation, financial motivation of those who want to be green uh, that it's a fait accompli. Another meta is that, of course, and Eurasian space will be, by and large, I'm absolutely sure, they say that they will be independent, they will be autonomous and so on, but they will copy Chinese uh, example of how to uh, transfer their economies and financial markets to ESG uh, uh, transformation and sustainable development. Uh, of course, you know that they promised to be, uh, to get the peak out of the energy mix by 2030 and then start drastic, uh, 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 to curtail drastically the, the emissions and all of that stuff. And at the moment, as, as we all uh, know, uh, on electrical mo uh, cars, uh, automobiles, on, on uh, uh, turbines for the uh, windmills, on, on all of this, they're well ahead of us. They're well ahead of Europe, and, but, uh, and they're number one in the world. And nevertheless, as, as was shown, coal production is grown and will be growing until 2030, but that's now in the Constitution of uh, People's Republic of China and in, in their documents of the 25th Congress. Uh, judging by what, how, disci how, how disciplined is the process is, they, they'll probably manage uh, zero by 2060. Uh, a couple of words on, on, on Russia. You're absolutely right. When the war started and you cut uh, Russia out of, uh, of your supplies, uh, the pivot to Asia was declared. And uh, at the beginning, discounts were 40%, both in India and in China. And in India, we couldn't uh, uh, convert this money. <laughs> There are still 14 billion uh, worth of uh, in, in rupees, and, and we don't know exactly the scheme on, on, on how to, to recuperate that and transfer it to, to real capital or real money. Uh, same in China. In China, Yuan, of course, is, uh, we have the, the, the trade in Yuan, so it's, it's easier. Uh, but at the moment, I would say that uh, according to the, our Ministry of uh, uh, Energy, the discounts go to 10%, and the volumes are considerable. Uh, definitely, uh, all kind of further sanctions, secondary sanctions, and, and so on and so forth, are uh, in force. It's difficult to, uh, to transport uh, oil and gas to, to, to the countries, which, to the friendly countries, put it this way. Lloyds, for example, uh, forbids uh, uh, insurance. But there are always gray, gray skins. And uh, Russians insure it in the international waters. The last mine is taken by Turks, by Egyptians, even, l l let us be honest, by Greeks and, 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 and people from, from, your, from your jurisprudence. So from this point of view, if someone thinks that Russia suffered a lot, yes, at the beginning it was a serious blow. At the, at the moment, we, we don't feel it. Uh, inflation is at 6% and the GDP growth is at 2.8, almost 3%. So when we compare the, the, the economic situation, economic warfare didn't work the way it was planned. That's, that's a fact of life. But that's short term. Uh, long term, uh, mid term and long term would be much more difficult because technological gap will not be covered. And then we will be dictated by our Chinese uh, brother who becomes a senior brother, and uh, senior brother always is, is a little bit tougher than, than, than equal brothers or twins. So that will be felt. That's already felt in the Far East, very much so, on, on many instances and in, in, in many fields. But I would like to say that, uh, of course, as it was discussed today in the political uh, panel on, on, on Ukraine, the sooner we start uh, negotiating and s ceasefire, the better for everybody. And in, w in view of what Total said on the general need for the energy in the world, uh, I don't think that uh, the best solution would be further sanctions, super sanctions, super, super sanctions. Because you left uh, Novatech, Novatech 
immediately replaced you by Chinese. A technology which is for needs for the Arctic drilling, okay, not immediately from the best producers, but, you know, immediately gray, gray zone and, and, and this uh, so-called parallel import technology arrives, uh, arrives to, to Moscow, uh, to Russia, excuse me. So uh, I will end up here. I, Russians, especially young Russians, academic Russians, intelligentsia, want to be with you in the same world process. And that was shown in, in the first part. And the second part will largely depend on geopolitics, much more difficult because here the invisible uh, hand of the market works uh, less efficiently when the politicians get into that. The sooner we finish this tragedy, the better for everybody. Thank you very much. I hope that I e economize for some of the f speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you for both for the presentation and uh, for the, uh, you, you are very precise. Please. Uh, just one simple comment that the easiest way to get rid of all these problems is for Russia to leave Ukraine. That's Tell it to so Mr. Putin, not of to course, me, okay? Of course, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, you referred to, to sanctions. Uh, to be frank, uh, the uh, Russian oil and gas revenues came back now to the levels before uh, February 2022. So. Are the sanctions Sanctions efficient? cost us overall, not, not energy, uh, about from 1% to 2% GDP, nevertheless. And it is felt, no question about that. But to say that uh, it was a, 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 how should I say, successful uh, economic warfare, no. OK, so uh, we may move to another uh, point of view. And uh, Naren, uh, Narendra. Taneja, uh, who is the chairman of the uh, Independent Energy Policy Institute, uh, which is a, a new Delhi think tank. So I leave, I leave you the floor to discuss about the governance, please. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the last almost couple of hours has, has been very different uh, color and mood in the room. So I don't know. Uh, you see, the, uh, the global energy gravis, gravity center is no longer in Europe or Atlantic. It's in Asia. And uh, uh, the 405 billion energy consumers in Asia, they are consuming uh, you know, maximum energy. Uh, and that's where the future lies, whether you're a Western company or Eastern company, you're from Europe or Russia or America, if you want to secure your future, you have to look at Asia. That's the reality. However, when I travel to conferences like this, is a conference actually in Global South, in Abu Dhabi, in Asia. But since yesterday morning, I've been feeling I'm in Europe somewhere, <laughs> and 70% of the time I feel is an echo chamber, you're talking to each other. Then why did I travel from Delhi? Or why did, for instance, people travel from Africa? So you have got this habit. You've got to understand the world has changed. The world has changed. And you see, uh, in Global North, there are only 1.4 billion people. In Global South, there are 6.7 billion people, including people in Abu Dhabi. This is Global South. We've got to understand and acknowledge it. You see, uh, I, I travel to Europe almost every month. And it's so suffocating to go to conferences. Because you, you know, the, the world is changing. Today, BRICS, somebody mentioned today, BRICS total GDP on PPP basis, actually, BRICS is today bigger. From the 1st of January, BRICS is bigger than G7. Why don't people realize that in Europe, in the Western part of the world? Why there is no realization that, look, it's a one small planet? and the world has changed. Energy, we, in this room, we're discussing energy. And going by the question answer, it seems that only region that matters is Europe and maybe the United States. That's the end of the world or the beginning of the world. My friends, the world has changed. You have already spoken for two hours, so allow me 10, 12 minutes now, because this is where the heart of the 
global energy is. So I'm representing the heart. I'm going to focus on energy governance and uh, 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 global energy order, and therefore, of course, security. You see, the fact is half, the, half of the world today is not even talking to each other. Because you're Russian, because you're Chinese, or because you are Hamas, or because you are Israeli, or because you are Africa, you are very poor. You don't deserve to be in the high table. Somebody mentioned yesterday, the richest continent on the, on the planet is Africa. So we got to understand that whether it's energy or is climate, you know, we need to engage the whole world. Unless the discussion or the conversation is truly global, we will actually end up reaching to the wrong conclusions. And when the conclusions are wrong, solutions that we propose to the world, or for that matter to the people of Europe, would not really produce any results. And uh, look at, for instance, climate. Climate for us in India, we have 1.4 billion people, densely populated country. Climate for us is science. How do we, how do we go forward? On the one hand, we have to eradicate energy poverty, and at the same time, we have to mobilize sufficient energy for our people. How do we do that? So it's science. But for many in the global north, I'm not targeting anybody. You know, I love Europe. I spent nine years of my life in Europe. I went to universities in Europe. But for many, climate has become a religion. You just can't have conversation on, on this matter. If you say, look, I mean, there are three billion people energy poor on the planet. We need to engage with them. We need to do what? No, it's a religion. How can you question it? I'm not saying everybody, but there are many. And that has become a, a, that has become a problem. And at the same time, when you look at the global narratives, whether global narratives on energy or global narratives on climate, because the West has the experience, you have a good think tanks, you have diplomats, you know how to articulate, is English language, is the French language, is and all that. All these narratives are dominated by the West. I'm sorry to use the expression, but that's the reality. So the result is, what we have seen in this room, for instance, and we have seen in the uh, conference also since yesterday, that that has become a challenge. The result is, until very recently, energy and climate were always talked in the same breath. Now, the global north, or if I may use the expression, the West, has decoupled it. Now, say energy is a different, is sovereign, different world, and climate is. If you are talking climate, you can't talk energy. Energy, then basically you can talk only about, only about uh, uh, renewables. This climate extremism is 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 actually bad for climate security, because if you can't have conversation, how can we find a solution? is bad for climate security, is bad for energy security also. Now, this is this climate radicalization that we see in quarters in the global north is today the biggest threat to energy transition. Because unless we go about for honest conversation where the interest of everyone is taken care of, how do we move forward? How do we move forward? And I give you an example. In my city, I live in New Delhi, we recently hosted G20 summit. And you know one thing? In G20, we have tracks on everything. We have tracks, tracks means this conversation on agriculture, on medical sciences, on damn everything, you name it, and it was there. But not a single track on traditional energy, fossil fuels. They were kept out of the room, completely. Energy, a green energy, many tracks. In the final declaration, no mention. And this is G20. I asked some people, because we hosted it, but a host does mean that you control the narrative, because narrative is still controlled by the West. And they said, oh, they don't want it. Now, imagine you're talking, you are G20, you are talking of securing future, but you, are, you have no discussion on that. Now the biggest challenge is, the biggest challenge today basically is that the way I see it, that no conversation is allowed on this. 
that we need to kind of recouple energy and climate. There is no other way. There is absolutely no other way. Number two, this tendency on the part of the global north to have conversation on the energy transition, roadmap energy, energy transition, which is basically the way they want it, not realizing energy and climate. Go to any village in Africa, go to any village in Asia, go to any village in Latin America. These are highly emotional issues and local issues. People worship trees, people worship local sources of energy. For many, energy and climate are very deeply integrated the way they live, the way they breathe. But if you think the West has got the solution and they have the template, you either accept it or we are, you, we are going to make your life difficult. If you are a smaller developing country, we will punish you one way or another. If you are a big giant like India, well, we can't punish you, but still, we will see. That's not how we work. Energy transition, different countries, different you know, uh, uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. Third point I want to make here is, look, Ukraine happened. Prime Minister of Senegal yesterday, she, was, she spoke there, Senegal. She used the word, and quoting her, um, these are not my words. She said, Ukraine is white men's war. Uh, these are not my quote. I'm just quoting her, she said yesterday. Now, the point is that, you know, the result was that energy has been weaponized. And you know who has suffered the most? Yes, in Europe, you build fortress, you got from the, you replaced your Russian energy with American energy and Australian and so forth. But do you realize that there are three billion energy poor in the rest of the world? Do you realize they are the one who paid the price? Do you realize that, you know, how many children might have died because of that? how many family budgets might have been disrupted and actually killed? How many people realize that? Uh, can you have discussion on this in Europe? I have tried, trust me, it does work. They don't want to listen to you because they love most as echo chamber. They love to talk with each other. Now the point here is that, you know, uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, uh, priorities, you see, I mean, they can have, they have the right because they have money, they have technology, they have everything. But the point is if we really are looking for solution, that's not the way to do it. Now, question is, you know, on a positive note, now what do we do, what to do? I think we need to, when it comes to climate conversations, you know, New Abu Dhabi is going to host the next COP summit. I'm not too optimistic, I'm very blunt. We need to basically reset the button on climate. Climate energy transition used to be in the very top of the agenda, global agenda, until two years ago, three years ago. Honestly, tell me, is climate now on the top of the global agenda? It's not, it's Ukraine. It's crisis in the Middle East. It's Taiwan, tomorrow is going to be something else. But when it comes to climate, if you want to have results, if you are really worried about you know, the global climate, you have to reset the button. We need to go back to the table. We need to really rework. Now, second thing is, we need to democratize all these discussions and conversation on climate and energy transition. Obviously, I mean that the process is not democratic. It's not democratic. It's mostly top-down, a top-down from the global north to the global south. Yes, countries like India and China, we assert ourselves because we can. But what about these 54 countries in Africa? How many countries in Africa can actually assert? There can be sanctions against them without calling them sanctions. Now, at the same time, I mean, there are many other things to do. De-weaponize oil. De-weaponize it. Gas. You're playing with the lives of the people, the future of the children, the future of you know, the economies of smaller countries and more vulnerable economy. 80% countries in the world, they are energy deficit. 80%, they import energy. The biggest trade in the world is actually oil. Oil is number one, uh, roughly accounts for 60% of the total global trade. Now, the point here is that, you know, at the same time, when it comes to uh, issues like, you know, uh, technology, green finance and all that, again, we need to reset set the button there. And we recouple again, as I said earlier, you know, energy and climate. 
and at the same time, is there any global energy order in the world? Where is the order? The world is all united. We are basically, is the polarization that's happening. If Russian oil and gas is banned, if it's sanctioned, Russians will have to find a way to sell it to whosoever can buy it. That means you actually are creating a parallel order. And in India, there was a question this to us. I mean, if Russians offer us better discount, you know, we will buy from Russia. If the U.S. offers, we'll buy from U.S. If it's offered by Rwanda, we'll buy from Rwanda. Oil has no nationality. Molecule has no nationality. We'll just buy it from there. What's wrong with it? You see, that's how it works. And then the, my important point is everybody is now saying that, you know, rule-based international order, rule-based international energy order. Who makes the rules? Who has made these rules? The West. And if you don't follow, then you are questioned. And if you follow, then you have to become a subservient. So what kind of world we are talking about? So just to close it, you know, I, you can understand, you know, I'm di putting a different perspective, and many of you are not used to listening to this kind of thing. So you'll say, who is this man? Where does he come from? We were so easy. So we were enjoying, you know, this echo chamber. But this echo chamber has been punctured. So sorry for that, if you think that's the way you feel. But the fact is, we need a global, a new international energy order. Number two, we, knew, uh, we need a new international energy governance. And number three, we ideally need a global, new global organization, which is basically can play some role in situation like this, circumstances like this, can step in and play some role. And fi my final point is that, for God's sake, de-weaponize oil, gas, and energy. It's important. There are many other things you can play with. Weaponize them if that's important. But this is something 3 billion energy poor on the planet, they need it. So for their sake, if you have any love for humanity, any love, and West talks about humanity and whatnot, I think de-weaponize it. Let oil and gas and these th or all these uh, commodities flow so that people can at least survive. Unless and until they survive, how can they really worry about things like climate? Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. I have a, a real, we have a real challenge because the cocktail is taking place at uh, 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 7.30. Uh, so perhaps if there is one question uh, and uh, one question and uh, afterwards we will move to the next speaker. Is there a question on this uh, interesting presentation and quite challenging? So I leave uh, the floor to Xavier Ploquin. Uh, he will give us uh, uh, the view uh, on uh, this issue of energy and, uh, and uh, environment and sustainable development. Uh, the point of view of the of uh, the financial uh, of uh, the financial institution. Uh, is uh, investment director and chief of staff uh, uh, to the CEO of Meridian, which is uh, an investment company uh, uh, specialized in sustainable infrastructure. So, sh seven minutes, no more. So. Hi, everyone. I also have a presentation that's way too long. So the good news is that I can pick and choose. And I will actually talk just a little about financing, because I had my advertising page about investment in the battery gigafactories. But I had a quite long introduction that actually echoes, I think, a little, maybe in a biased way, uh, the speech of my neighbor. Uh, because I wanted to start and to have a focus on my view, because uh, Meridium is a global infra fund developing long-term infrastructure. I personally also used to be an uh, energy advisor for the French Ministry of Energy, and I had to plan uh, energy in France. So I wanted to share a view that led, in the end, to the financing part. But since I will make it short, I will try to just maybe share uh, something about what I think is interesting for European strategy for uh, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation betting on resilience, adaptation, and sovereignty. The two first words being words that you don't hear everywhere. And the third one, 
that we use not to hear, but that we hear now. Ah, the presentation is coming back. So maybe just the first point is that, in my view, and I agree with what you said, Europe is actually the part of the world that's benefiting the most from the energy transition. Why? Because I think everything has been stated and uh, explained in the other presentation. There is a lot of text, so maybe if we focus just on the big blocks, just to remember that Europe imports massive amount of oil, gas, and coal. 93% of our oil, 89% of gas, 25% of coal, and it's not going to increase. Um, we are fully dependent on all the raw materials, uh, lithium 100%, cobalt 81%, nickel, uranium. Um, and in addition to that, it is very concentrated. The third point is that we have some manufacturing capacities, and we have important one in heat pump, for instance. We are global leaders. We are still leaders in wind, although the position is challenged. We are tech leaders in H2, even though the production is starting to grow in China. And we are a leader in nuclear, even though uh, our industry had had some difficulties and they are now recovering. Uh, but some important parts of the value chain are missing. Battery manufacturing, as I said, we have, in, we, we have invested, so I hope it will change, and PV production, which is close to zero. Let's not talk about food, because I want to talk about food, but I've cut the, the slides. But, and maybe there are just some elements that are important, but everything has been said already. Stated policy scenario from the International Energy Agency, oil keeps approximately at 100 million barrels per day. So it means it will remain a big commodity, it will remain something with price volatility and something that has a, an impact on our global balance. But what you can see on the right is that developed countries should reduce their consumption. And they are supposed to. Maybe we will grow other kind of dependency. We have not talked about hydrogen today, actually, because it's still something that's kind of science fiction. But if you project over 30 years, European Union is supposed to be a completely different from the rest of the world, importing mass of hydrogen, according to the IEA. Will it happen? Will it not? Anyway, it's just a substitution from a dependency to another one. And what's interesting is that in Europe, well, this is about metal, but I think we have all understood that we are basically fully dependent, that the dependency will grow. We'll need to expand the importation of lithium by like 18 times before 2030 and 50 times by 2050. So it is huge amounts. This is about PV, I will skip also. And I think we have seen nearly exactly the same, uh, the same chart, uh, Olivier. But yours one about inflation, this one is about the share of the GDP that, that has been used for energy. And what you can see is that we are exactly in the same situation as it was in the first two energy crises, uh, which is very huge. And what happened in Europe is that we have completely socialized this with a tariff shield uh, that increased the, the debt in, in France, for instance, 2.5 points, um, which means that uh, this is something that has a huge impact on our capacity to develop in the, to develop in the future. So the, con the consequence of the first part of my presentation was to state that, and I agree with you, when we think about energy transition, it's something that benefits Europe the most because we are by far the most dependent part of the world. Many parts are, depend uh, are dependent on energy imports, but we have the largest share for the moment, I think. What's interesting is that European countries could be considered rich enough to transition, and that's also the reason why they can push for that. But the weight of the transition is actually weighting very much on the households in Europe, and they have trouble facing that. So this chart is just to, to mention that if we want to target net zero and not stated policy, we have to find approximately 1 trillion euros in advanced economies uh, to invest starting in the next three years. So it is huge. And what's interesting is that over the long term, the total energy cost of a net zero scenario is supposed to be lower than something that's 
the stated policy. But the problem is that it requires massive investment. So that's why in the end I was supposed to talk about investment funds. Um, and the, the, what everything should have in mind, because I think that in, in these chambers we do not talk about households, we do not talk about the, the people enough, is that a study has been done in France about the cost of house renovation or about EV uh, electric vehicle acquisition when you, uh, once you take off the subsidies, how many years of salary it costs to a household. So the households are from left to right from the first decile, meaning the 10% less rich on the right, the 10% more rich. And what you can see is that basically a, reno a complete renovation of your household if you're in the 50% uh, less rich people in France, in France, after subsidies that can go up to 70% of the cost, still will cost you approximately two years of salary, which is something that you cannot afford, and the return on your investment is not enough, or you need to have like very long-term debt. It is a bit better on electric vehicle, but what is important to understand is that European households, even though they are supposed to afford and to desire climate mitigation, do not find the value today. And frankly, even though you think it, it is a religion, I think that most of the European households, they, they do not really care enough about climate mitigation to, pay, to spend two, three, five years of salary to renovate their house if they are told that it is for climate reasons. I, th I think that European households, they are not ready to pay, let's say, five years of... Ha of not, ready. not ready. No, I think they are not at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and bad news, so this is about hydrogen, but that's a figure. Bad news, you could think that debt was a good way to upfront the capex and pay over time. But this graph, I think, is one of the most insightful ones I've seen in years. So even if it's about hydrogen, it is why I've put that here. In 2021, if the cost base for a hydrogen project was 100%, in 2023, it's 150%. Much, m most part of the increase in cost is the cost of capital. Cost of debt has exploded. Debt is less available. And it's the same for every part of the energy transition. So the households that could finance their renovation by having 30 years debt at 0% cannot anymore. And this is, and this will have a huge impact on European households. So I will just use two slides and nearly not talk about financing. My conclusion about the, the European households is that the new solutions, the green new solutions are more costly than they, th they are supposed to. Because even if they are less costly than fossil fuel solutions, they are not when you compare to the fact that people are already equipped with existing fossil solutions. So they need not only to invest new capex, but to write down basically the one that they previously had. And people know that. And solutions that rely on, let's say, carbon taxation, they don't have the right time pace because you change your car every 10 years, you renovate your house every 20 or 30 years, but you pay your bill every month. So this is not an incentive that people are ready to accept. P green solutions, even in Europe, are not perceived as good ones because sometimes they are too expensive, you know, just the same thing, more expensive. Sometimes it less, it's more expensive and you have doubt about the fact that it works. There is a huge debate in France, in Germany, about heat pumps. Do heat pumps really work? when it's minus five degrees. And this is really hard to target, and it is not a geopolitical high-level discussion, but it's something that basically prevents people from buying heat pumps instead of, I don't know, gas boiler. And third, sometimes the solutions are expensive and they do not give the same service. Electric vehicle, for instance, they do not have the same capacity as a uh, regular uh, gasoline car. So it is very hard to convince people, and they perceive that the value is outside. In Europe, they perceive that if they buy PV, they buy Chinese thing. If they buy uh, EV, uh, they buy Chinese. It's often Chinese, huh, basically. They buy uh, foreign uh, products, and that, did, that, does not, that does not create jobs, and it creates dependency. 
And finally, as I said, the financing capacity is completely down at the moment because the debt is higher, inflation has struck, and in Europe, people need most of their cash to buy expensive housing, expensive studies in some countries, so they don't have that much room for additional expenses. Would you conclude the just conclusion in one minute? about this part, and it's in one minute, was that I think that a good way of probably discussing energy transition, and it will involve also the southern countries, is to focus on resilience, adaptation, and sovereignty. IPCC, for instance, showed a graph. That's the most interesting graph, I thought. We will not detail. It is one of the fact that most of the climate adaptation strategies, they also have benefit on mitigation. People are ready to accept adaptation measures because it will give them more value for money. It will protect them from heat wave. It will protect them for lack of energy for grid dependency. They will be ready to pay. Maybe Western countries should be able to focus on this kind of strategy that give basically the households value for money and to discuss with other countries how to phase out the more uh, polluting uh, fossil fuel, but not be completely focused on mitigation because I think it's not acceptable in Western parts of the world either at the moment. And I have not had the, to the time to talk about gigafactories of battery, but I, ca I can around the cocktail if you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, you uh, Sorry, I, I fully support what you said about uh, adaptation. Uh, in, I remind you that in K Kyoto Protocol, adaptation and mitigation were, tre were treated the same way. But unfortunately, unfortunately, COP after COP, adaptation totally disappeared. Uh, it came back recently, and I think it will be very important for COP28 to increase the uh, consciousness and uh, the, the, uh, the consciousness on adaptation. Sorry, I leave. Uh, Sorry, just, just two minutes. No, no, one just, minute. Just yeah. a quick question, just to check if we could have access to those slides. Uh, Xavier, if, if you could send those slides, it would be lovely because they were very interesting. Yes, I can circulate the slides. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, just we have just uh, seven minutes left. Uh, I, Valérie, Valérie Ducrot, some comments on what we heard and what the key messages you want to, uh, to give us. Sorry, just two minutes. I want to follow up on what you both said. First, Naranda, I fully agree with you. Uh, we are much more or too much European centric. For, for sure, we are talking about Europe. We think that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, is, um, yes, it is a very important uh, uh, war, but uh, outside Europe, they have a complete different vision and I fully uh, uh, support what you said. I spend um, much of my time in Asia, and it's true that the debate is completely different, for sure. Something I want to tell you, it is important to use what we have nowadays, especially in Asia. India is a member state of uh, United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Asia Pacific. Uh, three weeks ago, I was there, uh, I followed the entire week. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but India was uh, completely absent. So this is really the place that you have to use if you want to raise your voice. And what you mentioned from the glo Global South, it is absolutely true. But we had only uh, a China who knows how to raise uh, the, the voice, Southeast Asian, ASEAN countries. but. It's very important uh, what the discussion we have here, we need to use what we have and we need to be present. Uh, it's the same for the Euro uh, uh, European Union. We are centered on the European Union. Outside European Union, uh, nobody is, is, is following what's going on. And uh, just to what you mentioned about nuclear, uh, it's never mentioned in the UN. Absolutely never. I, 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 I'm, I'm 
I'm paid by, by, by uh, gas companies uh, because I'm the director of the Global Gas Center, but I'm struggling to defend nuclear, I'm struggling to defend uh, uh, gas, renewable gases. Uh, it's not only renewables. We are only talking about renewables uh, at the UN, at the COP, etc. And this is a disaster for the Global South. This is a disaster for just what you mentioned here, uh, uh, for even the citizen from let's say the north or west or how you call it you want and it's a completely disaster but we have to be here we have to occupy the field i was at this uh, uh, conference at the un uh, i was we were on i was supported only by uh, russian federation and central asia to have one paragraph on natural gas and the role in the energy transition so the, the, the member states, they have to be here and to defend because only to be, to be only present in Brussels, it's not enough. I'm telling you, it's not enough at all. And this is only uh, w what is we see everywhere. So I just encourage all your, your, your member states to raise your voice where, uh, and use a multilateralism uh, institution that we have. It's so important. Yeah. Thank you for this. Uh very strong uh, comments, uh, and uh, now I leave the floor to uh, to Marc Antoine, uh, who is uh, director of the Center for Energy and Climate at IFRI, and we will have the real challenge tomorrow morning uh, to present uh, uh, the uh, discussion of this session. <laughs> so you may perhaps summarize a Thank little you. bit or comments yes. on what you heard. Uh, I think Narendra woke us all up, so I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to continue in that vein. Um, now, I think um, in taking a global perspective, um, let's face it, Narendra, yes, you rightly said we need to talk more with one another, and I think still this is also a place where actually we are talking, and, uh, and I think that's very important. Now, let's face it, there is a very important momentum now. We have John Kerry meeting his Chinese uh, counterpart, uh, uh, Genoa, as we speak now, during several days, and uh, and then we'll have the Biden Xi Jinping meeting at APEC in San Francisco, and so this is unique because there is no uh, major COP development possible unless the Chinese and the Americans don't agree, and this is a momentum for them to agree. So I think we can be uh, expecting that maybe something will happen there. Uh, the second point is on what will it happen. Well, I think, and, and Nicola mentioned it, yes, the US has to do much more on fugitive methane emissions, dramatically more. It has to ramp up finance in that. And the Chinese need to peak their emissions way before 2030. And, and actually, both could do that. And then, of course, uh, to uh, phase down coal, I think this is uh, possible. And, and for India, Marina, it's a specific case. You emit one ton of CO2 per inhabitant when the Chinese do approximately 13 or 14, the Americans 16, and the year the UAE or Saudi Arabia 18. So there's a difference. But it brings me to my second point. We have to rightly discuss hydrocarbons, yes? And our governments understood this also, because uh, I don't know how many phone calls Patrick Pouyanné or the Shell CEO got from governments, uh, you know, help me here, help me there, what can you do? But it's a new reality. So they were not going to disappear. And energy security is central also in our country. So, so what we need to have a discussion on is an orderly transformation of the hydrocarbons. Yes, energy security is right. But the problem is if it's Iran or Russia that put energy security in the final declaration, everybody understands why. Right? So, um, so I think um, this is clear and avenue. And the story is the following. We need a predictable, stable oil price that allows consumers to afford the energy, but still to transition, the companies and the governments to have the resources to invest in the alternatives. But the problem is we need to have this discussion, and, and I think the discussion has gone away. That there were institutions for that, there were ideas for that, but I think it should be reinvested. And what we also need is that you, for example, India, tell countries here in the Middle East, Look, if we look at the map of renewables in the world, we almost see nothing here in this region. How can that be with all the money that you have? And then the second thing that you should also tell, because so far it's been France that has been pushing heavily for that, it's how come the emerging economies are deprived of liquidity to invest? 
into all these renewables, etc. right? If we look at the current financial system, the risk in, in emerging economies is much higher than in Europe, it's much higher than in many places where actually the investments are required, right? So this discussion has to be also taken up front uh, by, by you, and hopefully uh, there will be greater financial commitments here from countries in the regions towards uh, uh, financing uh, these low-carbon technologies and their deployment. Um, if you allow me just a word also, I think uh, India and other countries, especially us, and it was hinted several times, now we have the objectives, now we know uh, that the technologies work, we know that the costs went down, although they are up again because of interest rate, etc. What we need to focus on is value chains. Everyone has to invest into value chains, and, and here the states will have a major role to play. They have to provide guarantees, etc., etc., because otherwise uh, it will be very difficult for the scale-up and the de-risking. Um, last but not least, uh, if you allow me, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a word uh, on, you know, three years ago, four years ago, everybody was planning for an energy transition with low oil prices, with low gas prices. Well, now we will have a transition with high oil prices. And, and I think that's, uh, that's, that offers quite some interesting momentum. Of course, everybody's suffering, hence the need to, to orderly organize all that. But the point is, this is a unique opportunity to accelerate. And I think Total Energy, correct me if I'm wrong, but you would not be able to commit that much money to renewables, which are providing less you know, profits, if you didn't have these high oil prices. And, and countries like here, obviously, uh, would be able to commit less to meet their targets uh, if the oil price was $50. So, uh, so let's work on this opportunity, I think. And, um, and, uh, and, and also, let's, let's get out of this binary situation where, you know, the North thinks only about itself, the South is demanding and is the victim. I think it's much more complex, but uh, in any case, you're right, we need to work more together. Marc-Antoine, uh, Olivier, Olivier. I, I, I am not sure we heard the same thing this evening. Uh, what uh, Narendra said was something different, I think. Uh, uh, China was able in 50 years to increase the life expectancy of its citizens by using fossil fuels. And I don't believe that a country like uh, India and some African country will be able to have this level of development and this level of energy without fossil fuels. So what I heard Narendra saying is that countries like uh, India and other countries are going to use fossil fuel at a much higher level than uh, the, the actual level. And I think your summary was very biased. Quickly, if you allow me, Chair, uh, very quickly. You see, uh, when you look at India's track record on renewables, what we have achieved the last five years, trust me, is more than Germany you see, is better than our track record. What we have, we have been walking the, you know, talk. All that we committed in Paris, all that we committed in uh, Glasgow, or for that much, Sharma, we have already walked. We have delivered that. But that said at the same time, world over, 82% of energy that the world is consuming is coming from traditional sources. In India, story is more or less the same. 67% of electricity that we consume is coming from coal. Look at, you see, at the same time, you have to see India is not some small banana republic. We have security challenges from the north, from the Indian Ocean, from so many sides. When you look at India's energy scene, 88% of oil that we consume is imported. 88%. So we consume 5.2 million barrels of oil every day. Natural gas, we are importing roughly 56% of our total requirement. In solar power, 90% of equipment that we are using you know, for solar, are imported mainly from China. Uranium, you know, big chunk of uranium we import. So that makes us extremely vulnerable in terms of energy security. Now the question is that, you know, on the one hand, we have to see the renewable, and at the same time, we have to see the energy security because we are a very large country, and also we are threatened from all sides. The final point I'm trying to make is energy transition in a country like India and it, we, we are more committed than most countries in the global north. Uh, you can check it on the cold numbers, facts. But that at the same time, energy transition in India we will do with Indian characteristics, 
based on ground realities in India, based on the fact we still have 700 million people who are below energy poverty line. So for us, that comes first. And if there is international pressure, trust me, we are strong enough to deal with it. So uh, I am I'm sorry, it's uh, per perhaps the privilege of the president, but uh, it's uh, uh, 7.35 and the co cocktail started. Unfortunately, uh, we will not have the time for a debate on uh, more general issues. These issues I wanted to debate is what are your expect expectations for next uh, COP28 meeting. The second is perhaps a focus on uh, China. China is uh, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, and we need to speak about uh, why, uh, uh, about what will happen in China. And depending on what's happening in China, this will have a, a dramatic impact on the energy world and also on the environment worldwide. And perhaps also a question I wanted to raise. Uh, in uh, 1973, the uh, first oil shock was created by a conflict between Israel and uh, the uh, Palestinians. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, are we at the eve of an oil shock taking into account uh, it that, was not uh, with the Palestinian. It was an attack by Egypt and yeah, Syria yeah, at the yeah, same yeah. time. Know, the Palestinian yeah, had nothing to do with that. Sorry, yeah, Olivier, no, to, no, to just no, no. recall uh, that. I so know, history. I know, I know, but uh, there is uh, perhaps uh, there is uh, what perhaps there is. Uh, we are at the eve of uh, uh, perhaps an oil shock. Why not taking into account the fact that the depletion referred by Nicola is taking place and the investment of uh, in oil and in uh, oil and gas has been reduced by a factor of two since uh, 2014. So uh, it's for the time being the Palestinians, but what will be uh, the uh, position in the next few weeks of uh, the uh, Arab governments? I'm not sure. I hope that the, uh, what we heard from the, uh, the advisor of the president uh, uh, of the UEA is, uh, is right. So I want to uh, uh, thank uh, the panelists and also thank uh, the audience for this debate. And anyway, perhaps the next time it will be necessary to have a longer, uh, uh, more time to have a, a long, an in-depth debate uh, on uh, all around the world. Thank you.